Hello class, my name is Pastor Ben and um, today is going to be an interesting day probably with the topics at hand. You're going to hear from Keenan share on the biblical image of Gehenna and, and today I'm going to share on the image of death and what is it? Unpack that a little bit and obviously look at it in the Bible. Hey, let me open up with a word of prayer. And again, I'll, I'll introduce um, just the topic and everything for today. Let's pray. Almighty God, you are the Lord and the giver of all life. You sustain all things in your power, in your, in your wisdom. You breathe life into each one of us. You've created us, each unique. You've given us identities and names and different gifts, and we glorify you with our lives. Today's topic, Lord, is can be a heavy one, and so we just ask for wisdom as we think on these two topics. Pray for uh, just your understanding. Pray that we would be edified, that we would uh, take away from this class just your sovereignty and your control in all things, even when we face <clears throat> uncertain things like death or, or things that cause us anxiety, like the loss of a loved one. And so, Lord, give us strength, we pray. We thank you in your spirit. Amen. So this is a class on biblical imagery, and each week we kind of pull different images, different topics that we want to address, and so this week we're going to look at death, and Kenan's going to share on Gehenna. Um, and a lot of this content comes from the Dictionary of Biblical Imagery. And so really want to recommend a great resource to you if you um, just have any questions on all sorts of topics, persons, characters, or things like that. That is where we pull most of our content and uh, enjoy reading and learning and studying that and teaching it to you. So I want to point you to that. Today for this lesson, I also want to share that I uh, learned a good portion of the history that I'm going to share from PBS. And maybe you guys grew up watching shows on PBS. I know I did with the Reading Rainbow and all sorts of scientific kind of ways of learning uh, with the Magic School Bus or learning about history with the show Wishbone. And anyways, it, uh, PBS continues to be um, nostalgic for me, but also helpful <laughs> as there are many topics that you might want to learn the history behind those things. And, and so I just put those disclaimers forward that the Dictionary of Biblical Imagery is a great resource. And today I, I'm also sharing what I've learned from a PBS um, video. So without further ado, I, I want to begin, you know, always with the definition and putting forward to you what is death. If you had to describe it or define it, what is it? You know, if you think about it. For me, I put it's the absence of life, but then I, I gave a Google search and I came up with more specific terminology. Google says it's the end of life, uh, the end of life of a person or an organism. And so it's not just the absence of life, but it, it acknowledges that life did exist and now does not in this person or this thing. Wikipedia says death is the irreversible cessation of all biological functions that sustain an organism. For me, there was kind of a, a big word that jumped out of that definition is irreversible, right? I think death carries the weight and prompts the anxiety that it does because it is permanent. It's, it's irreversible. So let's, let's begin for the first part of, of this, unpacking the image of death. Uh, if you were to try to put forth an image of death, maybe you think of a battlefield, maybe you think of um, someone 
passing away in the hospital or something like that. Uh, a lot of history and literature and movies and things picture and personify death as this grim reaper figure who is, you know, this cloaked, hooded, skeleton figure in this black flowing robes from head head to, to toe, so to speak, and carrying a large instrument called a scythe, you know, a long wooden handle with a big metal uh, sharp blade on the end. And we know that that scythe is a harvesting tool and that becomes an image for death. So I want to unpack where that image for death kind of originated and how that came about. Why do we personify death as this cloaked hooded figure? And then I'll move into death in the Bible specifically uh, and the image of it there. So again, PBS shares um, the origins of the Grim, Grim Reaper, uh, how it originated in this kind of half um, middle of the 13th century. There was popular story that was circulating pretty widespread throughout Europe. It, it circulated in English, in Italian, in French, and in German languages. And the story goes something like this. There were three men, and sometimes people say, well, there were three kings or three hunters, but three men, three nicely dressed guys are out hunting, and they come across three animated corpses. These corpses are, you know, up and moving. They talk to them. They're in various stages of decay, and to the horror of those three men, they recognize these animated corpses as either their ancestors or even a reflection of themselves, that that the three animated bodies they come across uh, are almost mirror images of each one of them decaying, so to speak. And the corpses warn these three men or these three kings of the fleetingness of life, of how quickly life goes by and, and the grossness of death and therefore the need for repentance and to make sure that these men are leading a righteous life and, and going down a righteous path. That's kind of the origin story, again, middle of the 13th century, uh, widely held in the society of its, of its time. Now, if you're familiar with history, soon after mid-13th century, you enter into the 14th century, and what does most of the world of that time encounter but the bubonic plague, now more commonly known as the Black Death? And so we know that this plague spread monumentally. It, it went everywhere. It had effects in Europe, in Asia, and in Africa, and killed a great portion of the human population on the globe at the time. The statistics and the data at that time were a little unclear in terms of their record keeping, but some say 20%, some say 75%. Either way, even if it was 20% of the population, that is no small number of people uh, dying from this plague. And so when you have something like that take place. And maybe already by mentioning the bubonic plague, maybe this is already triggering for us more recently thoughts of the COVID-19 pandemic and the effect that it had on a global scale. But when you have a plague like that strike all of the human race as we know it, it's going to have a social effect. It's going to have a psychological effect. It's going to influence religion. It's going to influence everything um, with such great loss. And how do we cope with just masses, mass amount of, of loss and, and death? So um, some say that to make death personified then into something of a human figure 
was a way that these folks during this time, um, that's how they tried to handle and deal with their anxiety is, well, let's start to make death a figure that maybe we can talk to. Or if they have human-like qualities, maybe maybe they're not as scared. Maybe death won't be as scary anymore. If it's something, at least in a shape that I'm in a shape of, you know, and those kinds of things. So churches and cemeteries across Europe began showing these allegorical scenes of um people from all backgrounds and all walks of life. That means your kings and the, the highest of the highest to the lowest of the lowest, the paupers and, and the poor. Everyone, um, no one was safe from death. And so these artistic renderings and these paintings and these depictions of, of death have an effect on every race, every gender, every everyone. I mean, there's no discrimination at all when it comes to death. And money and status, it, it its power was kind of stripped away, rendered useless. You can't buy your way out of death. And so as these paintings began circulating, again, as a means to either picture some of the loss from the bubonic plague or as a means of beginning to uh, personify death as a person, that artwork began to influence the culture. And so in this same time, as we see death uh, portrayed in this artwork, oftentimes death is standing over numerous people, right? It could be a battlefield or something like that. And eventually death, as as it's being personified, begins to be the skeleton that is again decaying eventually uh that skeleton is standing upright and you see in the artwork how that skeleton begins to start holding different weapons some of those weapons are a sword uh sometimes it's a sickle which is a little handheld version of a scythe the scythe is the very long one sometimes it's a bow and arrow uh, but in any regard, death is viewed as having this weapon and its personified skeleton that is decaying. Now, as time goes on, all of that artwork has an influence on writers as well as, you know, the people. And so the poet Petrarch wrote a famous Triumphus Mortis or The Triumph of Death. And that was a poem, you know, a very famous work that was inspired by the artwork of these other folks rendering death personified. Well, as his poem then gains popularity, that poem begins to inspire other people to think about death and personify death as well. And so you kind of have this chain reaction of well, the plague is inspiring these effects in some people and and those people are creating paintings, and the paintings are influencing the writers, and the writers then influence more paintings. And it's just a constant um, chain reaction within humanity at the time on really how do we address death? How do we personify death? How do we take away the anxiety of facing death? And so um, it's interesting that as uh, Petrarch's poem gains popularity that more and more of these paintings begin picturing death as both male and as female at times. Uh, depending on the country or the time period, death was personified as male or female. For example, um, often, uh, often in the Latin-based and the Romance-based languages, death was usually pictured as female. But in the Slavic and Germanic languages, death is personified usually as male. And as we go back farther into European history and culture, how they have their culture and their roots in the Greco-Roman history, um, all of the male death gods from Greek and Roman culture deeply end up influencing the vision of 
who death becomes personified as. For example, uh, Thanatos is a winged figure who's often uh, attributed to being a god of death, but Thanatos, again, being a winged figure, is the was the god who would come and take away and carry away the dead into the next realm. He was more of a nonviolent depiction of a of a death god, so to speak. Now, the Grim Reaper, however, is often conceptualized as this forceful, almost violent-like personification of death. In other words, that he goes out and with his big scythe, he just mauls people down and collects souls. And, and it's almost like death is out to get you. Um, and it's much more terrifying when you personify death as a hunter or something like that. The male Greek god of time, Heronos, who is often confused with Kronos, Kronos. Uh, Kronos was the ancient Greek god of agriculture. And if you look at pictures of, of Kronos, he's a, kind of an older man and uh, with a big long beard, and he's holding a, a big scythe because of agriculture. And so you have these pictures then over time, you can see how the influence of a skeleton holding these weapons as the first original renderings of death. And now you've got the influence of, uh, of Thanatos, the winged God who carries folks away after death or um, of Kronos, who is the agricultural God holding this, sickle, all of these kind of images begin to overlap in people's minds. And you can see how they start to kind of get closer and closer and closer to the Grim Reaper as we have that image today in 2023. So by the time that the Renaissance artists um, are starting to, to depict death, all of these influences are overlapping. All of these influences are kind of giving us a skeleton holding a large scythe again the from probably you know floor to shoulder length with a big metal blade on it now the scythe again at that same time in medieval europe was actually growing in popularity in agriculture to harvest corn because it was much easier rather than holding a handheld sickle and kind of bending low and sweeping and doing all of that to have this larger stick to hold a blade. And then you could actually, if you are big enough and strong enough, you could really make some progress. It was much more efficient in your harvesting of the corn. And so it's interesting that as in modern agriculture at the time, as that tool becomes more popular, so too it becomes then the tool wielded by death. And there are many reasons for that. Um, as you think of harvesting, some people think of souls being harvested. As you think of certain times and seasons of, of a time of uh, planting and preparation, a time of, of waiting and growing, a time of harvesting, and so, so on and so forth, death itself has some kind of time connotations to it, right? And so it's interesting that the sickles themselves were called reapers. Those who used the sickles, they would reap. And those who used the scythes were called mowers because they would really just give a big long swoop and mow down a lot of their, their corn. So it's funny because according to PBS, they say the Grim Reaper should be actually titled the Grim Mower. <laughs> Interesting. I found that kind of funny, but in any regard, death uh, throughout the Renaissance eventually went on to take on kind of this image of compassion as well, believe it or not, that uh, in some paintings, in some renderings, you would have this kind of skeletal figure with wings, maybe with open arms. And now death is personified as this comp compassionate figure that is there to welcome you into the afterlife. And again, I think these are all expressions and ways to 
relieve the anxiety that we as human beings have on what do we do when we face this uncertain, permanent, irreversible reality that is called death. Now, in terms of the moniker, the Grim Reaper, and when that first appears throughout human history, in 1847, um, it pops up for the first time in an English literature called The Circle of Human Life. Now that was an English tra partial translation of what was a German devotional text uh, from 1841, which was tracking the life of, of a Christian at the time. But in any regard, that's where the first use of the Grim Reaper uh, came about. So that's just some, some history there on the image of death personified as this cloaked figure in a skeleton holding this large agricultural tool and why that character came about, why that personification came about. It came about as a response to large experiences with death and how do we as a human race uh, make sense of that psychologically or emotionally or or just socially, how do we, how do we swallow that reality and and still continue living? Well, we begin by personifying death. Um, it's interesting that this is a sidebar, but it's interesting that the Christian Church did the same thing with Satan or the devil. If you think about the image of Satan or the devil as this kind of red creature with horns, with a little black goatee, maybe on two legs that have hooves, with a tail and a pitchfork. Where did that Im image come from? And maybe I'll, maybe I'll speak more on that uh, at another time, but it came from the church's response to how, how do we deal with a figure that we don't fully understand? So anyways... History is always helpful. Um, I think it sheds light on what was going on at particular times and what influenced who and all of those things build upon year after year. And here we are still in 2023 and these same figures, these same renderings of death or, or the devil are still being used today. So without further ado, let's think now about death in the Bible. In the Bible, we know that Death is the greatest of humankind's enemies, right? It just is. If God is the God of life and God breathes life into us as mortal dust creatures, every single thing that we do will probably be to preserve our life. Now, in the ancient Near Eastern culture, death was called the land of no return. Right? It was viewed as this inescapable underworld or prison. Again, it's picking back up on the irreverse, uh, irreversibility and the permanency of, of death. But also, if you think about the biblical worldview uh, at the time and the three-tiered structure that, that God was in the heavens above and his throne room was, was way up there and that we as dust creatures are here on earth kind of in the middle, and there's water around us as well. But they also believed in under the earth, that down through a pit, so to speak, that that all the dead were buried in the ground and, and that there was an underworld where the afterlife took place. That was kind of a three-tiered view of creation. It also influences how they viewed the afterlife. And um, anyway, so the land of no return. Now the Old Testament picks up on this a lot of times throughout the Psalms. We hear she Sheol mentioned being a realm of under the earth. Its entrance into Sheol is, is a big old pit. And so let me give you an example. Psalm 88 uh, verses 4 through 6. The psalmist says, I am counted among those who go down to the pit. I am like one without strength. I am set apart with the dead. 
Let the slain who lie in the grave, whom you remember no more, who are cut off from your care, you have put me in the lowest pit, in the darkest depths. Your wrath lies heavily on me. You have overwhelmed me with all your waves. You have taken from me my closest friends and made me, a re made me repulsive to them. I am confined and cannot escape. So it's a picture, again, of this one-way ticket down into the underworld, a prison. I can't get out. I'm cut off from God, right? Those kinds of things. Now, there are rare, rare exceptions to the one-way ticket of death, right? Now, Canaanite myths will go on to picture their gods as um, at least death is a greedy god who is hungry and the way he satisfies his hunger is by gobbling up us mortal humans. It's kind of a, a little more morbid, of course, but the Bible does not necessarily picture death in that way, but it does personify death with a few things. Um, think of hunger. The Bible personifies the death that death is hungry. In Isaiah Chapter 5, verse 14, it says, Therefore death expands its jaws, opening wide its mouth. Unto it will descend their nobles and masses with all their brawlers and revelers. And it goes on to personify it as a crafty trap for, ex for victims, for example. And there's many kind of other examples of personification of death in the Bible. In 1 Corinthians 15, we hear that the last enemy to be defeated is death. death um, death's weapon for us as human beings, according to the Bible, is the fatal sting of sin. That it is our own sin that causes death and decay in our mortal bodies and which ultimately will gobble up our lives. And so death is the last enemy to be defeated. Ecclesiastes, the book of Ecclesiastes, if you take any time whatsoever to read that book, you will see that a major theme in that is death. Meaningless. Everything seems meaningless. Why? Because it all ends in death. Why work? Why, why, uh, why enjoy food? Why, why live life? when life is just a vapor and a mist. It's here one moment and it's gone the next. Life is meaningless, so to speak. That's the main thrust of that book. Make sure you read the last verses of that book because there is hope and there is purpose in life. But in any regard, death is the major theme of that. Now, we have to say this, that even death is subject to God's sovereignty. Death's origins are in God, and what I mean by that is, it is God who first um, shares or pronounces the reality of death to, to us as human beings. In Genesis 2.17, he promises death to Adam and Eve upon their disobedience, right? Do not eat from this tree or else you will surely die. Um, but also throughout Scripture, God uses death. Death is a, is a tool that God uses, perhaps as an ally, to uh, bring about his wrath upon those who have, who have been disobedient, upon the unrighteous, upon, upon the wicked. And so... As we start to hold up death, this scary figure, uh, the Grim Reaper, if you will, but then we come back and we look at who God is, we realize that even death is subject to Almighty God and His sovereignty. Um, in Isaiah 25, 6 through 8, it says, On this mountain the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine the best of meats and the finest of wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. 
he will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove his people's disgrace from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. So that's the promise of the Bible, that even death will be swallowed up. In other words, death that usually does the swallowing up of human beings and of all life itself will be swallowed up and will be no more. Furthermore, the claim of the Bible is that this defeat of death, while it sounds like it's a future reality for us, and it is, that reality has already begun or been won for us because of Jesus. The Apostle Paul puts it this way in Romans chapter 6, verses 9 through 10. He says, For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Now, Revelation 21, uh, verse 4, goes on and quotes the Isaiah 25, 8 text that we just heard. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Again, that promise that because of Jesus, again, the few exceptions to the one-way ticket that we find throughout the Bible um, Jesus resurrects a good friend, Lazarus. He also lays hands on um, the sick young girl who had died, but then he says, no, she has not really died. And he kind of raises her back to life. And you can think of some Old Testament prophets even who um, resurrected um, the widow's son, Elijah, did that. I think Elisha may have done a similar uh, healing as well. So there are a few exceptions of that, but it's not the norm. But it is the promise for the future that death will be no more. That there is, um, just as we are born into these human bodies, we experience our first birth into these human bodies. And while in these human bodies, we also experience a second birth from above when we are born again by faith in Jesus Christ. We're born twice. So too the Bible speaks of there is a time that, that we will die. And for some who may not have faith in, in Jesus, they may experience a second death. In John chapter 5, 25 to 20, or excuse me, 24 to 27. He says, Jesus says, Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. Very truly I tell you, a time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to judge because he is the Son of Man. So this, this theme and this motif, right, between obviously the, the image of death in the Bible and in our own lives, but it's the theme of life and death, right? It, you can't talk without death without also talking about life. You can't usually talk about life without, without also the reality that we experience death. And that's what the Bible talks about. It talks about our, our lives now. Why are we here? What are we to live for? Why do we exist? We exist because we have a loving God that created us in his image. We exist because... We are to live our lives to glorify Almighty God, to be in relationship with God. But because of our sin, we experience a spiritual death in our soul. And as a result, we end up doing and, 
and causing harm and and being sinful to our neighbors and in war or in other things cause literal death to our neighbors as well. And so it requires a being born again, but not physically born again, being born spiritually from above to have faith in God, have faith in his son and and live in that faith through the power of his Holy Spirit. The Bible gives the warning that Jesus' victory over death only benefits God's people. In other words, the application of Jesus' resurrection primarily is reserved for those who live in faith, put their trust in Almighty God, that he will look on us, and that when we do experience death, that just as Jesus was raised from the dead, the promises that so too will we, simply because of our faith, is a gift from Almighty God. It it is nothing we've done to earn, it's no work or will of our own, is a gift of God's grace and mercy to us. Revelation 20, verse 6, I'll close with this. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them. But they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. Death causes anxiety in all of us. Again, I think it's because of the permanency of it. You can lose a toy. You can lose, you can get in a car accident and replace your car with insurance. Or if your house burns down, maybe you have, hopefully you have insurance to replace things here in our world. We can go to the store and buy new clothes if we need to, but when a living organism or a person or a pet or something that we love dies, it is permanent. And that is a loss that carries such a weight that it's so heavy that it produces anxiety within us and grief. And we don't always know what to do in the midst of those emotions. And so we we personify death. Humanity has personified death over the years. But the Christian church and and the God of the Bible, we remember who God is. That God is God of the living, not of the dead. And because of that, we have hope. So friends, I hope that you've been edified today. I hope this has given you some helpful information as you think on the image of death and and certainly its influence in the Bible. This has not been exhaustive by any means. We could go on and on and on. But I hope more than anything that if you've had any experience with the loss of a pet or a loved one or death in your life, that perhaps this class or this sharing today has taken away some of that anxiety, has taken away the sting of death and its permanency in your life because God is is a God of the living and even death must succumb to the good God above's will. So may you be encouraged. Go forth in faith to love and serve the Lord. Amen.